All right, sorry for being a little late. Traffic's, uh, traffic's a bitch, unfortunately. Okay, so um, what I'm going to cover, just uh, just something to help you out with your lab, just in case you can't quite figure out how to implement it. I'm going to talk about how to implement uh, regularization for a linear regression and a linear algebra viewpoint. Just to give you a little bit of a hint in order for you to get it working properly. And then uh, there's one thing I didn't talk about, which is uh, classification accuracy. So when you're training, you're classifying, and you create a classifier, how well, you know, what's the performance measure? How do you know how well the classifier is working, right? So you probably want to use your training set and figure out how well uh, it accurately classifies your training set. So we're going to take a look at class classification accuracy, and then uh, we're going to have to uh, go through a brief probability review. So I know you hate that stuff, but this part of the course, at least just maybe for the f this lecture or so, you're going to need to know some probability in order with that in before we proceed. So conditional probability and Bayes rule. And then we'll do a review on uh, Gaussian distribution. So the bell-shaped curve, I got to talk about uh, single variable and multiple variable. I need to talk about that. And then uh, the fun part of the course, which is uh, Bayesian decision theory. So it's a way of doing classification in two classes or more classes in, in a probabilistic viewpoint. So what we've covered so far in logistic regression, they're known as what we call a discriminative algorithms. So uh, with, Bayesian, uh, sorry, it, with Bayesian decision theory, these are what are known as generative algorithms you're using probability to figure out whether or not it belongs to one class or another and we'll uh, cover that as we go okay so let me just uh, recap linear regression very quickly for the lab just because I, I released a document a week ago but uh, it is probably good if you actually see the rationale behind how we derive things okay so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna let the variable D represent the uh, derivative vector so all the way down to uh, theta n. So this is a vector which consists of derivative terms, where each of them is the derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameter that you're looking for. OK, so this is the uh, derivative vector of parameters. OK, so each term just computes what the uh, Derivative would be with respect to the parameter that you're looking at, so theta 0, theta 1, all the way up to theta n. Okay? So if you remember from the linear regression class, it was simply equal to this. Okay? So this would be the derivative term, or the, der the derivative vector. So this here is your data matrix. Okay? And there's something special about this. So it, it looks like this. All right? So the first column is all ones. Okay, and each sample that you're looking at is in a row. So this would be the first sample. So this is the first feature, the first sample, second feature, first sample, all the way up to the end. So there's n features in total. Right, and then this is the first feature for the second sample, all the way up to n. Finally, you go all the way down. This is the <coughs> first feature for the nth example, second all the way up to as many uh, example <coughs> examples as we have. Okay, so there's your data matrix. This here is your uh, parameter vector, right? And so it's theta, and then it's n plus one term. So you have the bias term, and then theta one all the way up to theta n. And this guy here was your uh, vector of estimates. So what the expected output would be given each training example. All right, so expected output. So this was consists of y1, y2, all the way down to ym. So for each training example that you have, you have an expected output that you're looking at given that particular training example. OK. OK. So the gradient descent rule, this is without regularization. And I'll show you what it looks like with regularization. So basically, you're taking your parameters theta, and you're computing an update. <coughs> So it's alpha and then times the derivative vector. Okay, so for each parameter that you have, you have to compute a, an update to move towards the minimum. Okay, so it's alpha and then this is d over here. So this goes down here. So one over m. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the rule without regularization. Okay? If you want to do it with regularization, it's actually quite easy. You don't have to do much. You just have to, you just have to compute the update 
very slightly differently. So it's going to look like this instead. Okay. So the bias term is unaffected, okay? And then what's going to happen is all the other terms are going to have that uh, factor, that uh, regularization factor in. Sorry, let me just go down here. So it looks like a sixth. That's not my intention. Okay, and this is one minus all the way down. I forgot the alpha term here the last time, so I sent a little email correcting people. So there's actually a alpha in there because of the learning rate. So you have this, and finally it's the same thing. You have alpha and then. Okay, so the term D also goes down here as well. Okay, so that's the only thing that changes. So the only thing that changes is this over here is just the update normally and this guy here. All right, so the bias term stays the same, and then everything else you're doing one minus and then alpha lambda divided by m, right? So this is the learning rate. Okay, this is the number of examples, right? And alpha here is what's known as the regularization parameter. It controls, you know, overfitting, as we talked, as we talked about last time. Okay, that's cool. All right, so that's the only difference. So the bias term stays the same, and then when you want to compute the other updates, you're doing one minus one alpha lambda divided by m, and then that's what you do instead. So all you're doing is just modifying that, and you're done. Okay, logistic regression is pretty much the same thing. The only difference is that once you compute your sum of weighted terms, so theta zero plus theta one times x one and so on, you apply sigmoid after that when you're done. So the rule is very simply, actually not the rule, sorry. Let's compute the derivative term. So this is the only thing that changes. <clears throat> All right. So this here is your, you know, your hypothesis and this is the sigma or the sigmoid function. Okay, if you recall it was one over one plus e to the minus z. Okay, so the only only, thi only difference between linear and logistic regression is once you compute your sum of weighted terms, so theta zero plus theta one x one, you apply sigmoid function when you're done. <coughs> okay, so what you're doing is apply sigmoid function to each element in vector x theta. Okay, so when you do the data matrix x times your parameter vector theta, you're actually going to get a m or m by one or m by one column vector. Okay, so you apply the sigma function to that. All right, so all you have to do now is the rule is pretty much the same thing as linear. So, <clears throat> and then we have uh, right, and then. Okay, so that's when, and then with regularization, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this guy up here. And I'm just going to remove a whole bunch of stuff. So, <coughs> okay, let me just get rid of this. So. Yeah, I don't need all this. Okay, so, okay, but in this case, this one's gonna change. So we have alpha, one over m, extra, and then g of, okay? So what changes is this guy, so you have a sigmoid here, and that's the only thing that changes. Okay, so it's the same rule as linear, it's just what's gonna happen is you have to do apply an additional sigmoid Two x of x of the end, and that's it. Okay, you're not uh, gonna use uh, gradient descent for the logistic regression lab. We're gonna, we're gonna do something else. But this is something if you wanna uh, implement it on your own. If you don't wanna use gradient, if you don't wanna use uh, built-in MATLAB stuff. Okay. Okay, let me just uh, cover a quick note on classification accuracy, and then we're gonna get onto uh, the uh, 
fun quote unquote stun of the course fun stuff of the course. Okay, classification accuracy. So uh, let's say you've got uh, you know you, you find your parameters and you get a model, a discriminative model that classifies between two classes, right? So how do you know how accurate that model is? Like how do you know whether or not you know you've got a good you know a relatively good uh, prediction model that will classify between two classes? So how do we know how accurate our classifier is? Okay. Well, what you can do is uh, once you create your prediction model, you can take those input samples that you have and throw them right back into your model. So the model that you've created, just take your training examples and throw them back in and see how good each training example's output compares to what it should be. All you have to do is just compare each of them term by term and then just count how many are correct and just calculate the fraction of how many it classified as correct. All right. So given a data set <coughs> and given uh, yi as the ith true label <coughs> and we'll call this y tilde i as the predicted label Okay, so the accuracy is just the following. The accuracy in percent is the following. Okay, so let me just uh, move up here. Okay, so the accuracy, <coughs> accuracy right, is equal to, let's see what we got. This is an indicator function. I'll talk about this soon. Uh, okay. So this guy here is what's known as an indicator function. So it, it outputs one if the condition inside is true, and it outputs false if the condition inside is false. I'll output zero, sorry, when the condition is false. So this is one if x equals true, and zero if x equals false. So, okay, so what you're doing here is you're just seeing what all your predicted labels are, you're comparing them with what your true labels are, you're comparing them side by side and seeing how many of them match up. And you're just counting up all the ones that were successfully matched up and finding the fraction of what, were, what was right compared to all the examples that you have in your training set. So this gibberish means that find the fraction of predicted labels <laughs> that match the true labels. It kind of makes sense, right? So if every single predicted label matches what you have in your trading set, then you obviously have 100% accuracy. It's very rare, but it happens. Okay? And then you can also do the same for your test data set. Usually you have a training data set that trains your classifier, and then you have a test data set that the training examples that are, well, weren't part of the actual training. You want to test to see whether or not new examples that the training process hasn't seen before can accurately classify your outputs. So there's a training accuracy and there's a test accuracy. So training is in, there's an accuracy for the training data set and there's an accuracy for the test data set as well. So find the fraction of predicted labels that match the true labels. Okay, and multiply by 100 over M to get percentage. Okay, and then M was the number of training examples, just to be sure. Oopsie, no, oh. examples. Okay, so there's the training accuracy and there's test accuracy as well. So there's diff it just depends on which data sets you use. Okay, that's just, I just wanted to talk about that before I get on to uh, the next stuff of the course. Okay, let me just make this stuff. I'm not gonna throw you into the pool and expect you to swim if you don't know how to swim. So I'm just gonna go briefly through a review of probability. Uh, this stuff sucks, but we're, unfortunately we're gonna have to cover it in this course. Okay, so probability, what, what the hell is probability? So what it does is that it deals with processes or, or sequences or events where you cannot reliably predict what the output is. 
right? So for example, tossing a die or flipping a card or tossing a coin, every time you do an action or an event, you cannot predict what the output is. Like you just, you have really no idea. You might expect it to be something, but you really have no idea what the output will be until you actually see it, all right? So deals with <coughs> Uh, processes <clears throat> or experiments. I gave a, like a little bastardized version of this last class. Like I wanted to talk about maximum likelihood of strainer, but that wasn't really uh, a good enough exposition exposition into it. So I'm I'm gonna cop I'm gonna cover it here. Okay, deals with processes or experiments that are non-deterministic, or you have no idea what the final output will be until it actually happens. Okay, so certain examples are you want to predict what the weather is. Like usually, you know, there are there's certain data that's coming in, you know, that you can, you, there's weather models that you can use to predict the weather, but you know, most of the time the weather guys are unfortunately not correct. So that's also a random, pro it's, it's also like a, a random experiment. It's, it's random, right? You know, tomorrow's weather. Right, or you know, uh, flipping a coin. Which side do you get heads or tails, right? Assuming that it's fair, you know, that it's fair sided, that you know, each of them are equally likely to be chosen. Okay, so if, if, if you're taking a look at machine learning systems, you can consider a feature as what's known as a random variable, right? So you can consider it as being completely random. Like you don't really know what exactly that feature will be. You'll know as soon as you grab a sample from you know, from whatever domain you're specifying, you know, you're sampling from. Okay, so we can consider <coughs> features in machine learning or intelligence systems or whatever, you know, whatever related field that you're looking into to be what's known as random variables. I'm going to abbreviate these as RVs from now on, not the actual, like, you know, recreational vehicle, but RVs as in random variables. It's too long to write out. I'm just going to write it in as RVs. Okay? So a random variable is a quantity that cannot be determined beforehand. So heads or tails is a random variable. Like, you don't know whether or not the coin's going to be heads or tails, or you don't know whether or not the, you know, the dice will be, you know, one to six. <coughs> Sorry, one to six. You don't know what the value is until it happens. So it's a quantity. Uh, sorry, quantity whose value can't uh, be determined beforehand. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to denote random variables. So random variables will be denoted as capital X. Okay, and are real valued. So you can represent a coin toss as a random variable, or you know, the uh, a card from a deck of fifty-two cards as a random variable as well. So there's two types of random variables. Okay, there's continuous random variables where the you know the actual variable itself can be any real number minus one, plus one, you know, zero point five, and so on. Right, so there's continuous random variables. Right, these come from an infinite set of values. Right, so examples could be length, uh, temperature, price, like anything that you can assign a, a real number to it that uh, the range is unlimited. Right, so length, temperature, price, and so on. Okay, so there's continuous random variables and then there's discrete random variables. Where discrete random variables only fall within a certain category or a certain subset of values. For example, you know, the number of transactions you make or the length of a tweet that you make on Twitter or, you know, the number of spam emails you get in a day. Like, it's, it falls into, you know, a, 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 you know, a finite set of values for you to choose from, right? So examples, uh, the number of transactions, 
on your credit card or in your bank account. Right, the length of a tweet. There's only a certain number of characters that are allotted to making a tweet, so you know, <coughs> you know that there's a finite set of values. <coughs> Same thing for transactions, like it depends on what bank account you're with, but they limit the number of transactions you make per day. Okay, <coughs> so each random variable takes on a value uh, due to an experiment or an observation, right? So for example, if the random variable was uh, you know, a die, for example, so when you do the experiment, that random variable will take on one of six possible values. So that's what it means by takes on a value. So when you do the experiment, that random variable will have some sort of value, and it depends what the outcome of that experiment would be when, you, uh, you know, when that random variable is assigned. Okay, so due to an experiment or observation. Okay, this produces an outcome. So the terminology is outcome. So every time you take a look at an observation and it produces something, it produces what's known as an outcome. Okay, so a set of outcomes is called an event. What you can do is you can group outcomes together. So for example, the event of rolling three heads consecutively or our heads or tails or heads, so that would be an event. It's a collection of outcomes where you're looking for that particular collection of outcomes to happen. So a set of outcomes is called an event. All right? So the, here we go. Here we go. we're going to define the notion of probability. So the probability PA of event A, right, is how likely <clears throat> that event will occur. Okay, that's like your bare bones, like Shams or Coles notes definition of probability. Right, so you have some sort of event. The probability is how likely that event's going to occur. So it ranges between zero and one. Zero means that there's no way in hell it's going to happen, and one means that, yeah, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. All right, so it ranges between zero and one. Okay, and this means that uh, will not occur, okay? And this means that it will definitely occur. Okay, so it ranges between zero and one. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna introduce some notation here, okay? So usually when you see this in textbooks, you see something that looks like this, probability of x equals x. Okay, so what this means is that it's the probability that the random variable will take on the value small x. So that's what this means, right? So this is probability that the random variable x will take on small value x. Okay, some people usually do it like this, or some people do it like this as well. It's just different notations. So there's one way to do it. And this is the second way to do it, so they're both the same. Some people like to do it this way, other people like to do it. It depends on which textbook you read. Some people like to do the first one because it's notationally correct, and other people like to use two because it's, you know, a little shorthand, but it, <coughs> it means exactly the same thing. <coughs> okay? Let's get on to what's known as mutually exclusive events. If this is actually a little important uh, before we proceed, so mutually exclusive. Okay. So what mutually exclusive means is uh, you've got, let's say, two events, A and B. What mutually exclusive means is that they will never occur at the same time in practice. So for example, if you're flipping a coin, you're never going to see both heads and tails appearing at the same time. Right? They're mutually exclusive events where one event and two, where two events cannot happen at the same time. There's, no, there's absolutely no way they can happen, right? Uh, unless you know you, you, you rig the coin, but that's, that's just, we're assuming that we're playing fair here, right? <clears throat> Mutually exclusive. So this is given two events, A and B, okay? Uh, mutually exclusive, this me sorry, this means we never see a and B occurring at the same time. Uh, 
That's important. So here's a theorem of mutual exclusivity. So if you know you're given two sets A and B, and if you try to find any common elements between them, if it's empty, right? So this is this means that it's mutually exclusive. So mutually exclusive. This is just set notation, which you can consider A and B as being set. So if you have two events, you can think of a Venn diagram. If you have two events where if you try to find what's common between them, if there's nothing in common between them, that's what's known as mutually exclusive. Therefore, if you wanted to find the probability of A or B, it's just adding them up together, which is nice. <coughs> so mutually exclusive uh, uh, events, uh, A and B, and this is the probability that A or B happens. Okay, and this is going to be useful for later. So if you can show that, you know, there's two events that are mutually exclusive, if you want to figure out the probability of either one happening, it's just adding up the probabilities together, which kind of makes sense. All right? <clears throat> okay. So there's mutually exclusive. Let's define something else. Conditional probability. <clears throat> this one is a very important theorem that we've got to cover. Conditional probability. So what conditional probability means is that um, you want to figure out the probability of an event happening given that something else has happened to influence the event that you're examining. <laughs> right? So probability of an event A happening is so not happening. Yes, given. Let me go full screen so you can copy uh, stuff above here. Okay, given event B has occurred. Okay, is. So we usually denote this as a vertical bar B. Okay, so. This is A and this is given. This, so this vertical pipe is notation and probability for given. Okay? So the probability of A given that event B happens is the probability that both of them happen at the same time divided by the probability of B by itself. Okay? So I remember what's going on the bottom is just whatever's on the right just goes on the bottom and then you have the probability of them both happening at the same time. And the condition is that this has to be greater than zero, of course. <coughs> Because if you have it as zero, then it doesn't really make any sense. So there's, that's one condition we're going to look at. So there's the definition of conditional. There's also the reverse, right? So it would just be probably with them both happening divided by A. Okay, what's interesting is that, you know, the probability of B and A happening is the same as A and B happening. They're both happening at the same time. So it doesn't matter which order they appear in, you're just throwing them all at the same time. Right? So, okay, so this is something interesting to note. So then I can play around with these. So what I'll do here is I'm going to bring both of these up here. Right? I'm just going to multiply both sides by P over A. And then what's going to happen is that these two things are going to equal. So you have P, A and B, P, B, right, equals. Okay, because since both of these equal, I can go down here. And then what I can do is I can rearrange for this. I can just take this guy and just bring it back down. Okay, so what's going to happen is that you can re-express this conditional probability as going the reverse way. Okay, this is infamously known as Bayes' rule. So there was, a, uh, there was a, a pastor or a priest by the name of Thomas Bayes, if I remember. I think his name is Thomas, but he was a mathematician and a pastor or a Christian uh, who actually developed this rule, which is actually pretty cool. So you don't really, so if you don't know what the, you know, the intersection of the two events are, you can compute it in terms of conditional probabilities. So there are three terms we're going to take a look at here. So this, this here is what's known as the posterior probability. Or this is the probability after the fact. 
Okay? This guy here, here, this is what's known as the likelihood or the class conditional probability. And I'll, I'll talk about how to compute these later on. This is the likelihood or the class conditional probability. Okay? This guy here is what's known as the prior probability. Basically, what the prior means is that if you absolutely know nothing about what is happening to your system, this is the probability of just choosing any event at random, just without knowing anything previous. Like, you don't know any, uh, you don't know any of the events that happened up to this point. So that's, what's pri that's what the prior probability is. And this guy here is known as the evidence. We'll talk about that later. So there's, so posterior probability is what you want to compute. <coughs> you have the likelihood, you have prior probability, and you also have the evidence. All right. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. All right. One more theorem before we uh, take a look at some examples. Okay. There's a theorem called law of total probability. This is not entirely useful for us, but it will. Uh, it, it'll be nice to you know to prove some stuff later on. Okay. So here's the law of total probability. So let's say you've got some event B that's happened, and then uh, there are other events that will influence the decision that you make with regards to event B. So what the law of total probability means is that if you want to choose, or the probability of some event happening is simply the contribution of all the other events, the probability of all the other events that contribute to that particular event that you're deciding on. All right, so let's see. So the probability. of an event B, okay, occurring. Uh, let's see here. Given a contribution of other events. Okay. And we're assuming here that uh, Let's see, uh, B is mutually exclusive with these events, okay, for this to work. So this, has, this is the assumption that we're going to make for this to work. Okay, so suppose that we have a set of events. A. Uh, right. C. Okay, so let's say we have some set of events, so A, A sub 1, A sub 2, all the way up to C. So the C total, uh, you know, set of events that we have. Okay? So, therefore, if you want to figure out what the probability of B happening is, right, it's simply figuring out what the probability of all of the, let's see here, uh, let me, actually, you know what, sorry, let me just get rid of this, this is not mutually, let's get rid of this, sorry, my bad, that's, that's an assumption for later, so let's just, yeah, just take that out of your minds for a bit, so contribute <coughs> of other events, so we're not assuming mutual exclusivity, sorry, that's, <coughs> that's another theorem, I'm getting mixed up, so here's the law of total probability, so a probability of an event B occurring, given a contribution of other events, and they are not mutually exclusive, I, I apologize. So, this is basically the probability of B happening, B and A happening at the same time. Sorry, A, I. And this is C. Okay, you know what, let me just do N here. Sorry, let's just keep the notation the same. Okay? So that's what the probability would be. So you're, j you're taking a look at you know, um, you, you know, you're taking a look at events that are joining and just adding up all of them together. And if you want to apply Bayes' rule, simply P and then <coughs> all right, so this is because of Bayes' rule. Okay? And then finally, what we can do is, yeah, uh, therefore, what we can do is we can calculate the conditional probability as such.
right? And this is P of B. And then what we can do is we can put this guy down here and then it'd be this. So this is the final Bayes rule. Sorry, this is a P. Okay. All right. So that's your final rule. Just, just something to add in. It's not really important, but I just wanted to be complete. Okay, so there's your law of total probability. All right, so let's go back to random variables for a minute. Okay, so um, when you're taking a look at random variables, what you could do is you can actually plot the distribution of probability. So the x-axis would be, you know, all the values that the random variable could possibly take up. So in case if you have a dice, it can range between one and six. And the height would be the probability of that particular event occurring. Okay? So that's what's known as a probability mass function when you're taking a look at discrete, or a probability distribution function when you're taking a look at continuous. All right, so for random variables, we can plot, just take a look how much time we got, the probabilities, probabilities. Taking a look at so. Okay, good. Okay, good. I'm going to end very soon. So if we can plot the probabilities of every. I'm going to take another 10 minutes, so we'll take a break. Every possible uh, outcome. Okay? So for discrete random variables, this is what is known as a probability mass function, or PMF for short. Okay, so PMF, and continuous random variables, this is what is known as a probability distribution function, so PDF. So probability distribution function. Okay, or PDF. Okay, so... And then uh, there's certain special uh, probability distribution functions, the probability mass functions, where when you take a look at a random variable, the, the way the probabilities are spread, some of them actually follow very special behavior. So there's one of them that you're very familiar with, which is known as the Gaussian random variable, the Gaussian, distri Gaussian distribution function, which means that when you're taking a look at a feature or so, uh, when you're sampling, when you're just grabbing features randomly, when you plot what the probabilities look like, the probability of a, that particular feature occurring, you'll see that it looks like a bell-shaped curve, which is what's known as the Gaussian function. All right, so <clears throat> there are some uh, PMFs or PDFs that some random variables uh, follow, where that some, that some random variables uh, follow a particular pattern, a particular distribution or particular pattern. Okay, and uh, you know pattern or behavior. Okay, this is what's known as a probability model. Okay, because what you're doing is you are trying to classify or you're trying to group this distribution of features into what's known as a probability <coughs> model. And <coughs> the best known one is the Gaussian example PDF, the Gaussian. You've you know you've you've actually seen this. A little bit so far, but I'm going to formally, <coughs> formally define it here. It's Gaussian or the normal distribution. Okay, so there are many random variables that actually follow a Gaussian nature. Uh, Gaussian in nature. So there's many random variables that are many random variables are Gaussian in nature. Okay, which what I mean is that they have what's known as a Gaussian distribution. So have. Usually when you take a look at measurements, when you're measuring the length or width of something, that's usually Gaussian distributed or the height of a, of a person. That's also Gaussian distribu <coughs> distributed as, as well. <coughs> so in this course, we'll assume that the features are Gaussian. There are actual legitimate statistical tests you can use to uh, figure out whether or not the feature that you're looking at is Gaussian distributed, but 
just for most of the time it does happen. So we assume <coughs> features are Gaussian. In this course, we assume features are Gaussian. Okay, so that's a point that I want to bring home. Okay, so uh, for one feature, right, what it looks like, the probability or the PDF looks like this. This is the very infamous, I suppose, bell curve or bell shaped curve, the normal distribution. <clears throat> okay? So you have an input variable x, so that, that's the random variable you're looking at, and then there's two parameters that define what a Gaussian is. You have this guy here, sigma, which is known as the variance. Right? It basically controls the spread of the Gaussian. So the larger the variance is, the larger the spread the bell shaped curve is going to look like. Okay, so the variance. So this, uh, let me see here, it's the spread of uh, the spread of the random variable. And then people also deal with what's known as the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance. So you can deal in either or. Some people like to use a variance because it allows for non-negative numbers, but that's just something else. Okay, this guy here is what's known as the mean. All right, this is the average value. Average or the expected value. Of the, of the random variable, okay? So if you were to take a look at this feature and you pull the particular feature, you sample this from your problem set or from your, from your data, you would expect with high probability that the feature you get matches this mean. But obviously it's a random process, so you don't really know until you actually take a look. But that's what you expect to happen, okay? So let's see, mu or expected value, that's good, all right? So this is the spread. So let me just talk about this a little more. So the uh, spread here, the sigma, tells you how likely or how likely the outcome will be <coughs> uh, let me see here. How likely the outcome is away from, will be uh, away from the mean. All right. So the farther away, the less likely it's going to occur. I'll define this soon. So farther away, less likely to occur. Okay. I got a few more minutes here, and then uh, we'll take a break. All right. Just going to define a couple more things, and we're going to see some pretty pictures. So here's some definitions. Okay. This is a continuous random variable, so just I just want to throw this in, just uh, you know, just for the sake of completeness. But you know, really, it's not that important. So we're going to talk about what's known as the population mean, population mean, and variance. I'm not going to expect you to compute this. I'm just putting this in for the sake of completeness. Okay. So to do this, you take the integral. Okay. And then the variance so just is just for completeness. I'm not going to expect you to compute this at all. Okay. So what it means by population mean and variance is that if you were to inf sample as many possible points as you can, an, infinite, an infinitely number of samples, this is what you would expect the mean and variance to be. But usually in practice, you know, infinitely many is obviously not achievable. So when you sample as many values as you can, you can approximate what the population mean and variance are by calculating the class mean and variance or the, the sample mean and variance, right? So <coughs> most of the time, we don't know this because you need to find all possible outcomes and their probabilities. Okay, so that's just impossible. Not impossible, it's just hard to do. 
Okay? So what we'll do is we'll approximate by the sample mean invariance. Sample mean invariance mean that when you take a look at feature, you're grabbing a whole bunch of features, you have a collection of features available to you, what is the mean invariance in that collection by itself? So the more that you sample, the closer it will be to the true mean invariance. Okay, so, so it's one over m. Right, and the variance here, or the one over m minus one. This is x. Okay, so that's what we actually computed as. Okay, so this here is your ith training example. Okay, this is assuming one feature, so I have one feature only. We'll talk about multiple features later on, but this is just assuming one feature. So the mean is very easy. You're just adding up all the features and just dividing by as, so adding up all the samples and just dividing by how many samples you have, and the variance is also the same. So you compute the mean first, and then you're adding up the sum of squared differences between the sample and the mean, and then you divide by one over m minus one. It's what's known as the corrected or the, uh, the bias corrected variance. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a couple of pictures and we'll take a break. So <clears throat> let me just show you uh, a couple of pictures. So let's see. Uh, here's one. Okay. So I just want to give you a visual illustration of what things look like. So this here is a Gaussian where the mean is zero and the sigma is one. All right. So this is what happens when we vary the standard deviation <coughs> or the, uh, the variance. So when this becomes two, what's going to happen is that this is wider than the other one. So when the variance is where the sigma is equal to two, uh, wider, wider uh, with wider width. Okay. And this is what happens when the sigma is 0.5. So when we reduce it by a factor of two, it's smaller, right? So width is smaller. <coughs> okay, also take a look at the height as well. So if you make <coughs> it wider, the probability is gonna be lower. So it's lower than this guy, right? So peaks are lower. And then if you compare with the shorter one, Right? Peaks are larger. Okay, so with a shorter width, the peak increases. The reason why is because you have to make sure that the total area is one, but oh, you know, that's just a minor fact. Okay, so that's what happens. And then finally, I have one last page and we'll take a break. <coughs> Looks like this. <coughs> this is what happens when you change the mean. Nothing special happens. So if I keep the, you know, the standard deviation the same, right? So it's sigma one here in all cases. Right? So this is what <coughs> when I vary the mean. <coughs> As you expect, what's going to happen is that you're just shifting where the center of the curve is going to be. So when this is mu is equal to minus 1, what I'm doing is I'm moving, move to the left by 1. The width is the same. It, d it doesn't change. Right? By 1. So you're moving this way. And then finally, when you have mu is equal to 1, you're just moving to the right. Okay, and that's it. So the width doesn't change, you're just moving where the offset is gonna be. So the width doesn't change. Okay, so I'll take a break here and we'll come back, we'll do some more probability review before I get on to the nitty gritty stuff of the course.